What I, what I share this morning, I've said this many times to you before, is the result of 30 years of ministry to the Lord, plus all that I have read and what I have borrowed from many others. Okay, but I would say to you tonight that the message I've got this morning actually ties in also with the evening message. I'll be going on again tonight, continuing on. I've been thinking long and hard about Trinity. How many of you know that we're being blessed? I know we're having all the other pressures. The enemy is chucking the, everything at us. But we are being blessed. But how many of you know that in the time of being blessed, it's the easiest time to settle into a rut? To get so comfortable. Oh, this is nice. And we just settle back, and that's exactly what the enemy wants you to do. And that's been on my mind while I've been away. There comes a time in our lives, as a church, and as individuals, when we've got to move on. It applies equally in the physical world, as in the spiritual world. And I'm saying to you this morning, church, the time has come for Trinity to move on. I'm in Exodus 14, if you want to cast your eyes down to verse 8. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites, who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi Atheroth, opposite Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to, into the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. And Moses answered the people, do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Look at that last word. Last two words. Listen to what God is saying. Move on. He was saying to the Israelites, quit living in Egypt. Quit talking about Egypt. It's time to move forward. The people of God were looking back when they should have been going forward. Physically, they were out of Egypt, but spiritually and mentally, they were still in Egypt. And I want to say to you, church, we're never going to move forward until we stop looking back. Too many times our spiritual gearbox is in reverse when it should be in drive. And I'm talking to each and every one of us. It is so easy to keep that gearbox in reverse. As a church, there are some areas in which we need to quit looking back and we need to move forward. The more I've thought about it, the more I've realized there's so much we will lose by looking back. But there's so much we will gain if we will only go forward. Friends, now is the time to lay down the flesh and the soul and to move on into the deeper spiritual things. So many are allowing the world to hold and influence them. 
Can I just share three basic principles with you that we need to apply before we can even think about moving forward personally and as a body, as the church. First of all, we've got to forsake the past which oppresses us. We've got to get past sins dealt with and out of the way. Jesus died, shed his blood for our sins, that we might be redeemed. If we keep holding on to the past and things that we have done, we're actually saying that what Jesus did on that cross is not good enough for us. So we need to deal with the past. Whatever you've done in the past, nothing is unforgivable except one, and that's grieving the Holy Spirit. But whatever you have done can be forgiven. And it's funny that I had that word this morning, that God is looking for people to come in full repentance. It's no good just laying it down for a moment and going to God with repentance and the moment you come out of the prayer closet picking it back up again and looking over your shoulder. Get over it. It's gone. You're never going to change it. We will always have a past. Is that true? I haven't got a magic wand. I have Christians come to me and they, they ask for prayer. I think they believe I've got a magic wand that when I wave it over them, all their memories and their hurts and their failures are going to go. It doesn't work that way. Absolutely. God taught us that many years ago. When you can get your past or something you have done, you can pin it on the wall. At the bottom of the stairs is the best place where you've got to pass it all the time. When you can pass it and read it and it doesn't cause any commotion within you, you're getting over it. Amen? I haven't got a magic wand. I wish I did. But that memory and that hurts and that failure is always going to be there. But we need to get over it. You need to understand that their past and this is a new day. A day where we can accept the freedom that Jesus is offering. What the Son has set free is free indeed. Amen? Now let me talk to you about past sorrows. It is right that we grieve. And it is right that we spend time in sorrow. However, there comes a time when we have to let it go. And we have to come out of grief and sorrow. Grief and sorrow is for a season. It is not for life. And there are some here who are still grieving over things that happened a number of years ago. That season's over. Let it go. You can tell I've been dwelling on this, can't you? I'm getting excited. Now here's a biggie. Forgive the people who offended you. There's not one person in this church who's not been offended at some time or other. But some are trying to move on, carrying huge weights with them. And God gave me a picture of a man walking up a hill, carrying two great big bags of sand. Hard work. But it's the same in the spiritual world. Grudges are heavy to carry. And they'll wear you out. We will never be truly free until we learn to forgive. Think about this. Who's doing the hard work keeping someone in prison? In the prison of unforgiveness. Being a spiritual jailer is a 24-7 duty. If you're going to keep somebody in unforgiveness, you've got to be going it constantly. Friends, 
one thing I can promise. As we move forward, the way is not always going to be flat and easy. There will be times when we're going to be struggling uphill. And even, dare I say this, it's going to be more than a struggle. We're going to be in a battle just to move forward. But I want you to get hold of this this morning. Will you take hold of the promise that God has given us? Paul had it right when he wrote this in Philippians. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. How many of you are, are tired of looking back and going nowhere? How many of you want to move forward? Let me just talk to you why as a church we've got to move forward. Let me share that the Christian church in the Western Hemisphere is suffering from a credibility issue. And when you get hold of this, you may begin to understand why the world doesn't want to listen to our message. And the, the fact is this. In a great part of the church in the Western world, there is no difference between church and world. Now, I can't use British figures because they're not available. I'm going to use American figures. But truthfully, there's not a lot of difference. Among those who identified themselves as Christians, 50% of them are not sure of their salvation. 60% of them don't attend church. 70% give less than 1% of their income to the church. 80% have no ministry within the church. And 90% have never been trained to be disciples. Now in America, I don't know whether you're aware of this, and in fact goes with this for Britain as well, 3,500 to 4,000 churches close every year in America. In 1900, there were 27 churches for every 10,000 people. In 1985, there were 12 churches for every 10,000 people. The average size church is 75. 85% of them have stopped growing and are on the decline. But what really hit me, I was looking at a book written by Henry Blackaby. He wrote a book called The Experiencing God. And he said, there are just as many abortions inside the church as outside the church. There's only 1% difference in gambling inside the church as outside the church. And George Barner did a survey of 152 separate items, comparing them with the lost world and the church, and he said, there's virtually no difference between the two. Makes you stop and think, doesn't it? Why are some Christians so effective and others are not? Well, the simple reason is this. Many Christians have settled for living below their divine privilege. Listen to the words of Jesus from John 10. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Notice there's a comma in that sentence. On what side of the comma are you living? I have come that they might have life. Are you that side? Or are you the other side, have it in the full? I can't answer that for you. Where have you settled? I know what I am. I'm on the full stop. That's where I want to be, okay? 
Are you just existing in church or are you living? Jesus died that we could have a real life. A life that is full of his presence and full of his power. A life that makes a difference in this world. And a life that's given us an expectation for the next world. So let me ask you a couple of questions. How many of you would like to move forward in your relationship with Jesus? <laughs> Hallelujah. How many have felt that they're stuck in a rut? Even pastors get into a rut, okay? Talking to a lot of people, I'm finding that people are not satisfied where they are. They all want more. No, the problem lies in this fact. That too many churches tell people that they need to move forward, but they don't give them an opportunity to move forward. People have got dreams and ministries, but they're locked up inside, and they don't know how to get up to the next level. No, it's my desire. This is what I've come back off holiday with. That I personally want this church to move up to the next level. I want to go up to that next level. I want to go up to the level that God has attained for us. I read a while back in a, another book called Dream Releases by a man by the name of Wayne Cadero. And he said, the richest place on earth is not the diamond mine of South Africa or the gold catches of Ecuador. It's not the oil fields of Saudi Arabia or in the uranium excavation of the Balkans. Neither is it in the mineral depths of the Dead Sea nor the richest plot of land on this planet. You might have passed it recently. It's the cemetery. That's right, the graveyard is the wealthiest place in all of creation. Beneath those rectangular pieces of soil lie countless unsung melodies, unwritten poems. Those grassy plots overflow with brilliant ideas that could have transformed entire communities, rehabilitating the lost and born hope to the weary. How burial grows reek with unattained success and unrealized dreams. You see, there were things that could have been done that couldn't happen because people couldn't bring themselves to the realization. So I'm asking you, church, and I, I've had a little count here this morning. It's nearly all Trinity people here this morning. So I'm blessed about that because I'm talking to Trinity. I ask again, are you ready to go forward? Let me tell you a, a true story of a soldier who was at Pearl Harbor. On the night before they were attacked by the Japanese, he and about 12 of his buddies went to a Bible study. They sat around the room and the leader asked these Christians to quote their very favorite scriptures from memory. The scriptures that meant the most of them in their lives. And there was a guy who'd gone to church all of his life and he began to freeze because he couldn't remember one scripture. They started, unfortunate for him, they started on the other side of the room. How many times have I been there? But I've been fortunate, it started on the other side of the room. But as they're getting nearer to him, and they're reciting their favorite verses, he's beginning to panic. And then all of a sudden, and Brenda will remember this one, he remembered John 3, verse 16. And he said, that's what I'm going to quote. And the guy sitting next to him quoted, you can guess it, John 3, 16. And when it came to his turn, he looked up and said, I'm sorry, 
I just don't know any verses. And he went home that evening spiritually whipped. He thought, here I am. I've grown up in church and I can't even remember a scripture verse. I'm still a baby. Little did he know that on the next day the sirens would sound and he would go to his battle station. He said, I looked overhead and there was smoke all over the harbour and those Japanese planes were flying all over us. He continued, I grabbed my gun, but all we had was fake ammunition. But in panic, I grabbed my gun and fired into the air, in the air at the plane. I was firing blanks for about a quarter of an hour. And while I was there, God spoke to me. God said to me, that's exactly how your life is. Your life is full of blanks. No power, no effectiveness, no light, no salt, just blanks. And there's a real enemy all around you, bombing you and shooting you, and you've got no power. And the soldier said, on the deck of that ship, I looked at God and I said, if you let me live through this, I'll get out of this baby carnal Christian stage and I'm going to grow up and I'm going to become a Holy Spirit filled so that I will no longer find any blanks in my life. Church, why are so many Christians and churches firing blanks? And the answer is quite simple. They're focusing on the wrong thing. You see, the most important factor in the life of the church is ministry. Amen? Forgive me, I'm not... Salvation is the important thing. But once you've been saved, the next important thing is ministry. It's only when the people of the church serve in ministry that Jesus can actually use them in a powerful manner. The power of Christ is at the disposal of the church. Anyone that seeks his face and wants to serve him can have a ministry. And let me add, there are many ministries that don't require for you to be at the front. Very often, God uses people who are behind the scenes. We need to face the fact there are a lot of people who don't want to change. Let's be honest, I don't think any of us like change in our lives. One man once observed that the only people who do like change are wet babies. And even they aren't too excited about it and they can kick up quite a fuss. True story, back in 1912, Ford Motor Company had a production manager by the name of William Knudsen, considered one of the best in his field. Knudsen became convinced that the Model T, which had been in production for four years, needed to be updated. But the only problem was, Henry Ford loved his creation so much, and it was well known that he opposed changing anything about the car. And according to Robert Lacey, because he wrote a biography called Ford, called The Man and the Machine, Hudson thought to convince Ford by building an updated and impressive model to show what could be done. Ford had just returned from a European vacation and he went into the Highland Park garage and saw the new design which Hudson had created. And on the scene, mechanics later revealed how Ford responded. They say that the car was a four-door job, and the top was down, it was painted in gleaming red, and it was built on a new low-slung version of the Model T. And one eyewitness says, Ford had his hands in his pockets. He walked around the car three or four times. And finally he got to the left-hand side of the door, 
took his hands out of his pocket, got out the door, and he ripped the door right off his hinges. He jumped in. Bang, there goes the other door. Then he kicked the windscreen out. And he wrecked the car as much as he could. Needless to say, Hudson left General Motors. Henry Ford nursed the Model T along, but design changes in the competitor's model made it so old-fashioned that people weren't buying it, but he wouldn't admit it. Now, Henry Ford was one of the most creative men of his age. And yet, although he had one of the great minds of the day, he resisted the obvious need for change. Well, I need to tell you, God's not going to force you to change. You can sit in that chair until you go to glory. And you can remain the same just thinking about the old times. And whilst you do that, the church will begin to close. Thousands will be going to hell because you don't want to change. Let me bring you another passage of scripture. Matthew 14. Let me read a couple of verses to you. Verse 22 on. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And later that night he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. And shortly before the dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand, caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. I don't know whether you've ever noticed, but Peter was always zealous in that he wanted to be with Jesus. Peter's greatest desire was to be with Jesus in any way possible. In the account I've just read to you, he was even willing to walk on the water to be with Jesus. The disciples were out on this lake and there's a great storm going on around them. Now come on, these disciples are experienced fishermen so most likely they knew some things about boating but tells us that they were afraid. Then we learn that Jesus walks out to them and Peter speaks, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Peter just wanted to get to where Jesus was. He wanted to get to Jesus so badly that the waves didn't put him off. He knew he would be safe with Jesus. Do you notice that Peter didn't say, let me walk on the water like you? He wanted to get to Jesus. Peter wanted to get where Jesus was. Church, how much zeal and passion have we got to go where Jesus is? Peter was the type of guy that always longed for an opportunity to be used by God. And sometimes it was that same zeal to serve God that got him into trouble. 
He had a, 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 an unmatched zeal and passion to serve. He was excited about what he believed. Now sometimes, being Peter, he didn't think things through. And he spoke before he really had considered what he was saying. But his heart was in the right place. Sure, Peter had faults like the rest of us. But his zeal can serve as an example for you and I. Peter wanted to be an instrument to be used by God. And God used him. Remember that God used him on the day of Pentecost to lead 3,000 people to the Lord? A lot of times zeal is nothing more than idle talk of what people want to hear. We are, as people are very good at talking. And not always so good at walking the walk. We should want to be used by God and want to put our zeal and our excitement into practice by serving in whatever capacity God wants us. A lot of times, however, people want to have zeal and excitement, but it's no more than words. Zeal for the Lord should, be, should lead to serving the Lord. And excitement and a passion for God should lead us to be willing workers for God. And I'm going to share again with you. There's a ministry waiting for you. I share that many have been crying out to God to be used in ministry. Well, I'm going to tell you, God has given End. God has given. I'll use that passage where Elisha bent down and picked up Elijah's mantle. It's in 2 Kings, if you're looking for it. 2 Kings 2. Elijah then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the banks of the Jordan. Now listen, church, if he'd not picked up the mantle, he would have never stepped into the prophet's office. So many have been crying out, but they failed to pick up what God has given them. My experience is that God very often allows us to start in the smaller ministries, and as he sees our zeal and our passion building, then he moves and brings a greater anointing. That's exactly the story of my life without going into it. Jesus knew that faith and obedience must be expressed in new actions for maturing believers. When Jesus invited people to walk on the water, he just said, come. That's all, come. And we're told that Peter got down out of the boat, he walked on the water and came to Jesus. But then he looked at the wind and he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. You see, the end of that passage is, you have little faith, why did you doubt? Well, I'll say this to you. Often new experiences and new ministries require a higher level of faith and obedience. Let the Lord show you the greater things as you're expressing a new willingness to go out into uncharted waters, into new relationships, into new ministries, but above all, just being obedient. William Booth said, Faith and work should travel side by side, step answering step, like the legs of a man walking. First faith, then works. Then faith again, then works again, until you can scarcely distinguish which is the one from the other. Jesus honoured people who were willing to risk shame, frustration, and disappointment, and disappointment but they had come to him in faith. Remember the Canaanite woman? The disciples had tried to put her off. 
12 men couldn't put her off. She came up, she came up to Jesus and just said, Lord, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terrible from demon possession. And as I said, the disciples said, send her away. And she came and knelt before Jesus and said, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And Jesus answered, woman, you've got great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed. Be willing to risk in order to see what God wants to do. Another example would be the woman who risked everything so that she could touch the hem of his garment. Now if you want to be just play safe, there's going to be very little reward. Martin Luther said, God our Father has made all things depend on faith so that whoever has faith will have everything. And whoever does not have faith will have nothing. Friends, if you want to move, we've got to recognize his voice. Because that's his voice we obey. Learn to distinguish between the flesh and the spirit. And when he asks, we obey. Now another good thing for you to do is to remember previous victories. Have a positive testimony. Keep reminding yourself of what God has done in your life. Walk in your testimony. I've shared this before. When I first came to the Lord and God led me into healing, the first things I ever prayed for was dandruff. The little things. But because I've seen the success of a lady's hair clearing up from dandruff, I was then able to begin to think and to move on to the bigger things. And I told you about the barren woman who became pregnant after countless operations. We need to walk in the testimony. And remember that promise when he said, I will never leave you. Fears. I've got to share that we've got to recognize and face our fears. Each time we give in to the voice of fear, we're just making it more powerful in our life. But what I want to get over to you this morning, realize your potential. As I said, it's time to step into your ministry. No one else can step into your ministry. John 17. It's a modern translation, the message. In the same way you gave me a mission to the world, I give them a mission in the world. All right? God gave Jesus a mission to the world. Now he's given his disciples a mission to the world. Realize this. Supernatural help is, is present. It's available. Peter wanted to walk on the water. Now he knew that such a task was impossible on his own. But he knew that the supernatural power of God could get him to do it. So please, church, don't be satisfied with just having a touch of the Holy Spirit. Be absolutely filled with the Spirit. You can't, your ministry cannot really start until you have got that fullness within you. But we also, and I'm going to end on this one, we need to remain constantly focused. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Look full into his wonderful face. And the things on earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. But I end with these words. You'll never walk on water until you decide to get out of the boat. I believe that as a church, and I'm talking to Trinity now, that we're going to be asked 
to do more, to do something that we've never done before. The question is, church, are you willing or do you just want to sit in that comfortable rut? Tonight, I carry on on the theme of ministry. It would be lovely to share with you here. Amen. Thank you, Lord.